Sure. So we had, uh, uh, we derived del x mu e to the pi k z1, z1, k1, z1, del x z2 e to the pi k2 x z2, and del x e to the pi k3 x z3. We derived this three point function last class, and I'll need your help in getting it right, I'll need your help in the factors. So here we had, um, uh, okay, and let's put zeta one, zeta one mu, Z, zeta two nu, and uh, zeta three rho. Okay. Uh, so, of course, the answer was proportional to zeta 1 mu, zeta 2 nu, zeta 3 rho. And uh, then we got, we had this lovely rule, right? The rule said that every del x insertion pulled down a factor of, what was it, i, k, um, was it i, k, i mu divided by k, j mu? Z i minus Z j, yes. sum over j. J not equal to i. Uh, and I've got Z i minus Z j, right? So let's call that Z i j. And then there was plus del x tilde mu. Uh, where del x tilde mu was a formal oscillator, which contracted only with other del x tildes. Didn't contract with the exponents. Okay? And then we had a factor of like this for each, each guy. Okay, so similar factor for each guy. And then we were supposed to take the expectation value over del x tilde contractions. But del x tilde contracts just like x tilde x tilde is minus alpha prime by 2. And there is extra z i j to the power, what was it, alpha prime k i dot k j by 2 with a minus, with a plus, with a plus with a plus, because there was a minus in the two point function and minus, yeah. This one has minus alpha prime by two, oh yeah, that's good. Uh, minus alpha prime divided by two, okay, good. Uh, we should have guessed that because, you know, this is dimension length in space time. There are two, two dimensions here, there's world sheet and space time. You can give them completely, keep them completely separate. Count space time dimension, that's length. This is momentum, so there has to be length square. So that, that, that was why there had to be an alpha prime. Okay, excellent. Similar factor for each of the three, and then we do the contraction. Now, I'm going to give you the answer, but before I give you actually just the answer, it's sort of trivial to work it out. It's interesting to check that the zij dependences cancel with that of the ghost, the sea ghost. That they, z12, z as we've done for simple amplitudes, right? That is really the check that you're getting it right. If you're not getting that, you're making a mistake. Okay, but assuming we get that right, of course the answer is a number. Well, more or it's, uh, the answer is zeta, zeta, zeta multiplying a tensor. So the question is, what is the answer to that tensor, the three index tensor? Now look, let's look at it structurally. First, we could have terms with these three k's. Okay, or we could have terms where two of the del x tilde's contract with themselves, and then you'll be left with one k. So it's clear that this tensor will have one derivative terms and three derivative terms. Okay, so it's some, some tensor which will be partly one derivative and partly three derivative. Okay, and uh, it has to be transverse to all the, uh, all the zetas. This largely, not completely, but largely fixes it. Uh, so you could more or less guess what it had to be. In fact, in the case of superstring, the superstring, as we will see, it will completely fix it. Okay. Um, and uh, now I'm just, so this whole thing, whatever it is, Pulchinsky gives it a name. He calls it V mu 1, mu 2, mu 3. What does he call it? T. Oh, V he uses for the superstring. I think he calls this T. T mu 1, mu 2, mu 3. 
and uh, this is the answer for this. It is equal to um, K23 mu1 eta mu2 mu3 plus K31 Yeah, plus cyclic, exactly. Eta uh, mu 3 mu 1 plus k um, 1 2 um, mu 3 eta mu 1 mu 3. This is the one derivative part. And then there is the three derivative part, which is, that's actually very easy because it's just this, this, this. So clearly it's just k cube. Okay, but you remember that the k's that can contract with a particular zeta are essentially unique. Okay, so I'll be right it the way he has. Um, so the k's that can contract with zeta one is exactly k two is the same as minus three k three, and we've chosen to write it always as k two th two three. So basically, what we will get from here is uh, um, Pratt's alpha prime by 8 k 2 3 mu 1 k 3 1 mu 2 k 1 2 mu 3 um, and uh, um, this factor of 8 has two sources firstly this alpha prime by 2 multiplying everything but that's not the main thing because you know there's a firstly there's a there's a factor of alpha prime even in this term there's an one factor of half here there are three factors of half but a lot of this eight comes from well you have to do it you know even when you do the z's there are factors of two left over the numerator and denominator cancelling there are some factors of two left over and a lot of the eight comes from this would naturally come with let's say one of the k's but then you make it k23 and that becomes k23 divided by 2. Okay, so you, there's some factors of 2 that you have to work out and this is what you get. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, let's do a couple of exercises about this. Okay. The first exercise we want to do is um, uh, is to check that this amplitude is gauge invariant. What does that check mean? What do we have to check? Exactly. So zeta mu 1 goes to zeta, sorry, zeta 1 mu, 1 mu goes to zeta 1 mu plus k mu, k 1 mu. This amplitude is invariant. Okay. It's clearly symmetric between 1, 2, 3. So if we check it for 1, we've checked it for all of them. Okay, so let's look at this. Zeta 1 clicks with mu 1. So this term here changes with k2 minus k3 dotted k with k1. But this is 0 because k2 dot k1 is, and this is k2 plus k1, the whole thing squared, minus k2 squared minus k1 squared, the whole by 2. And k2 plus, this is k3 squared. These are all massless particles. Every term here is 0. Okay? So here, every term is 0. It also cancels between each other. Any what? Any dot product is 0. Exactly. Because, it is because it's massless. Okay? And similarly, we get the same structure here. So it's obviously gauge invariant. Is this clear? Funny. Now, why did we do this calculation for the boson x-ray? We did it in order to compute the three-point scattering of gravitons. So far, we haven't got any gravitons because we've only done the left-moving sector. But of course, what we get, well, uh, how, how are we supposed to think of it? We're supposed to think of uh, the graviton polarization as being h mu nu, which I will, which I, I will denote by zeta, zeta tilde. Okay, that's the basis of h mu nu. 
in order that be traceless, zeta and zeta tilde have to have a zero dot product with each other. Okay, so we've got one zeta here, then I, I'll have a zeta tilde mu. I could have done something more general. I could have just started with the h mu nu's. But it's a little more convenient to think this way, and there's no lack of generality. Since given so the amplitude is linear in the, in the bilinear zeta zeta tilde, and so, so things of this form are a basis for the general, the general symmetric density. Okay, so we've got zeta tilde one, zeta tilde two, uh, and let's call that mu prime, mu prime, uh, zeta tilde three, rho prime, and then this multiplies t again, mu prime, mu prime, rho prime. Okay, so let me write it more, more, more clearly. The full answer is zeta um, one mu, zeta two nu, zeta three, uh, rho, zeta tilde one mu prime, zeta tilde two nu prime, zeta tilde three rho prime, t mu nu rho, t tilde mu t, t mu prime nu prime rho prime. And then if you want, you can just replace this zeta 1, zeta tilde 1 with h, h mu mu prime. Actually, this capturing amplitude can, uh, contains in it everything. It contains a three-point amplitudes of any combinations of b mu nu, graviton, and, and the dilaton. Because we just have to choose these guys. OK, so let's, OK, now I'll do that replacement. So we'll write this as a1 mu mu prime, a2 nu nu prime, a3 rho rho prime. If a is massless, uh, uh, traceless symmetric, we've got the graviton. If a is anti-symmetric, we've got b mu nu. And if a is pure trace, it's proportional to identity, uh, we've got the dilaton. Okay, so this scattering amplitude captures basically every three-point function in the massless sector of the uh, bosonic string. In particular, and since it's in or since it's gauge invariant, separately on left and right, it has both the gauge invariances of the graviton and the gauge invariance of B mu nu. Because remember that the gauge invariances of graviton and B mu nu, which are some linear combinations of the left-right gauge invariance. One plus one is one plus, and the other one is minus the symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations. Okay. Now, um, now, let's look at this amplitude uh, in derivative expansion. Okay, the amplitude in derivative expansion contains, as we said, each of these contains either one k or three k's. Okay. Uh, therefore, uh, wh what do we get? We get terms with two k's. That's when one meets one. We get terms with four k's. That's when one meets three. And we get terms with six k's. That's when three meets three. Okay? So you have three different structures, all of which survive when we take this to be completely symmetric. For so, so now let's take the case H, H, H. Symmetric, symmetric, symmetric to start with. Okay? A symmetric traceless. Symmetric traceless, symmetric traceless, symmetric. Grab it on, grab it on, grab it on. So we get three different structures, one, which is, one of which is two derivative, one of which is four derivative, and one of which is six derivative. Now you can ask, what are these structures? Now, it's easy to find what the two derivative structure is. You just compute it. So let's, let's compute. The two derivative structure is this guy replace t with this guy. That gives you the two derivative structure. Okay? Now, t replaced by th with this guy, this squared contracted with the am amplitudes, you can easily verify is the Einstein three-point scattering. Okay? Why, wh why did this have to be Einstein? Well, it's clear. Einstein is gauge invariant, of course. But it's also two derivative. Another little exercise you can do for yourself is you can check that th there is a unique gauge invariant amplitude for scattering of 
massless gravitons at two derivative order using only two k's. In fact, there is a more general result. The more general result is that, uh, in fact, we briefly talked about this last time. Um, we uh, briefly talked about it last time that at if you look at the scattering of three gravitons, go on. Where is the higher derivative term coming? Uh, coming. How is it different? How is it different? You see, there are three terms in this thing. One is a two derivative structure, one is a four derivative structure, and one is a six derivative structure. No, no, at the moment just in the amplitude. We'll come to where that comes from. Hang on for a minute. Okay? First, let's look at the term that is two derivative. Okay? That structure I'm claiming comes from Einstein. Now, let's, to understand this structure better, uh, I need to tell you one thing. Uh, do you remember last class we talked about how you could go through a little exercise to enumerate possible three point functions of gravitons? All you have to do is to find uh, functions of A, A1, A2, A3, and the k's, okay, that were gauge invariant. And we knew exactly what we meant by gauge invariant. Okay? Once we had that, we could multiply them by any functions because there are no kinematical invariants for three point functions. So they would be unique. Okay? And uh, uh, that program, though we've not done it in class, is not hard to do. And actually, it turns out, as I think I mentioned last time, there are exactly three invariant structures. There are exactly three, three structures you could write down for three point functions of gravitons. One of them is two derivative. One of them is four derivative, and one of them is six derivative. And all these structures appear in the bosonic string. Okay? So what we get is some linear combination of the three structures that could have appeared. And at the level of scattering amplitudes, that's all there is to say. But we're not interested just in scattering amplitudes. Because we want to think of space-time and try to understand what kind of action uh, such, a, uh, such an amplitude can come from. Okay? So we already know what action gives rise to the two derivative structure. It's Einstein. But what kind of action could give rise to the four derivative structure? What kind of action could give rise to the six derivative structure? Well, um, let's, let's, think about, let's think about this problem for a minute. Okay? Let's first think about the problem from the point of view of um, for the, for the four derivative structure. Let's write down every action we could write down at four derivative level for Einstein. So the three terms, uh, apart from terms that are obviously total derivatives, there are three terms you can write. The square root g, which is times r squared, plus r mu, that's a b. You could also have written down something like del square of r. But that's a total derivative, so we ignore such terms. Is this clear? If you think about it for a minute, you'll see there's nothing else you could write down, which is coordinate invariant, four derivative, means bilinear Riemanns, local. Hmm. And. Uh, uh, is, uh, so, uh, let's say square of the wild uh, terms that are related. Uh, that's by some combination of these. Combination of yeah. So, this is a basis for everything you can. Yeah. Uh, so you may for some purposes want to use a different basis, but this is a reasonable basis. Now, it might seem therefore, there will be three different scattering matrices. There should be three different scattering matrices at uh, four derivative level. Each of these Lagrangians should give rise to its own scattering. You've got A, B, C. How does it work that there's only one? The answer to this question is interesting. You see, um, imagine, uh, Evaluating, imagine evaluating the S matrix. Okay, imagine evaluating the S matrix. Um, uh, uh, imagine evaluating the S matrix using uh, uh, using Feynman diagrams. So what you would do is to take three parts, expand these things to cubic order. Okay, and take three uh, propagate uh, and just 
just just the coefficient of the cubic interaction. Remember, you're going to put this coefficient of the cubic interaction where each particle is put on shell. Now, first we'll say this in a pedestrian manner, and then I'll give you the deeper layers of the Okay. So now let's take one uh, one of these guys. Let's say R. I want to evaluate it up to um, uh, up to cubic order fluctuations. So what are the options? R, we could try to take one R and expand to cubic order, and the other R and expand to zeroth order, except that R vanishes at zeroth order, because zeroth order is flat space with, with no R. So the two options we have are second order in one R and first order in the second one, or vice versa. It's the only way we can do it. Now, R, when evaluated first order, on shell, is zero because the waves that come in obey Einstein's equations, and so may r equals zero. So it's clear that the scattering amplitude you get from here will actually be zero. Similarly, the scattering amplitude you get from here will be zero because Einstein's equations imply r mu nu is equal to zero. Okay, here not. Because R, R, R mu nu will, can be zero without R alpha beta gamma being zero. Mm. So you can expand this to quadratic order, this to linear order, you get something non-zero. Each term is non-zero. Now let's look at this more fundamentally from a more interesting point of view. Why did it happen that there were some terms of the Lagrangian which gave you zero scattering amplitude? Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Uh, the way it happened went, went as follows. See, what we're doing is taking square root g times r plus treating this guy as a small perturbation and working at linear order in this guy. Now there is this interesting thing. When we work with Einstein gravity, we have a clear notion of what the metric is. Because, meaning we don't allow ourselves to do field redefinitions of the metric. Why not? We don't allow ourselves to do field redefinitions on the metric because if we do a field redefinition on the metric, any coordinate invariant field redefinition we do would take the Einstein action, which is nice and two derivative, and make it some higher order derivative action. So for instance, consider the potential field redefinition. G mu nu goes to G mu nu plus, plus alpha r G mu nu plus beta r mu nu where well, alpha and beta are some, some coordinates of dimension uh, length square. You are also seeing, I mean, you are also considering the change in derivatives. Yeah, I'm doing a field redefinition that is not homogeneous in derivatives. Why you only? Why only? You can go to higher order. Okay. Huh? So higher order means you are considering it in, in derivative expansion. Yeah, because we're trying to construct actions in the derivative expansion. Okay, but now if I plug this field redefinition to the Einstein action, the Einstein action was originally two derivative. I work to first order on these alpha and beta, I will get terms that are four derivative. So it looks like a stupid thing to do. There's clearly a distinguished choice of metric for Einstein theory. So let's go back. See, whenever you write down a Lagrangian, whenever you, you have a Lagrangian of any sort, you can always do a field redefinition. Nobody can stop you, right? Because if you think of the path integral, for instance, or the Lagrangian, the classical mechanics, it's a functional which means there's no preferred choice of variables. You can do a change of variables in an integral. Nobody can stop you. However, there are sometimes canonical choices of variables you want to make, which are very clear for physical reasons or for mathematical reasons. And in the case of Einstein actions, it's a very clear choice for what you want to call the metric. If some you want to work in the case of your Einstein action, you define the metric as that, that choice of field in which the action is two derivative. Somebody can make a field redefinition like the one I've done and get some very complicated action, but you notice that there is a way of undoing that field redefinition and making the action two derivative. So that is the distinguished choice of metric. That's the choice of metric we always use when we're studying Einstein action. Uh, when we've got scalars in the game, there are two uh, there are additional choices we can talk about. String frame and, 
Einstein frame. Um, there's another, another choice that's canonically made in what's called Einstein frame, which is uh, have the coefficient of square root g r to be 1. Outside two dimensions, you can always achieve that by wild rescaling. We'll talk about that as we go along. You're saying we can undo this whole excel. And to, to the simple. Ah, that's, that's, that's my point. Now, so far, what, I, what we've talked about is when we had Einstein action. But now as Schumann guessed, why did I bring this up? I, I brought this up because look, now when we've got, we're starting with a four derivative action, what could the principle on possible field redefinitions be? The principle on possible field redefinitions could be, let's work with choice of field redefinitions that keeps the action no more than four derivatives. Okay, also I'm going to work such that this guy and this guy have the same order. And I'm going to work only first order in these smallnesses. So when I do my field redefinition, I have to do it only on this part. Okay, otherwise I generate something of second order, which at the moment I'm not interested in considering. There are two constants on this. Exactly. Exactly. Now let's see what doing this field redefinition will generate. When we do such a field redefinition on this part, what kind of terms do we generate? Okay. Well, we, you might think it's very complicated, but actually we know the answer. We know the action answer because we know how Einstein action changes to first order. It changes by equations of motion. So if we do this, we will get square root g. Uh, G, delta G mu nu times R mu nu minus R G mu nu by 2. Now we plug in this change in delta G mu nu. It's clear what we're going to get is a linear combination of R mu nu, R mu nu and R square all kinds of terms, but all of them will be either R mu R mu or square. There are two numbers in our field redefinition, so we can use these two numbers to remove these two terms or to set them to anything particular we like. But we cannot get rid of this term by this manipulation. Okay? There is another simple way of seeing it. You see, what was the general principle? The general principle was that actions that differ by term that have at least one factor of the equation of motion can always be brought to each other by a field redefinition and therefore generate the same S matrix. If you've got a factor of the equation of motion. Now, what does it mean that you have a factor of the equation of motion? Another way of saying that is that terms that vanish on shell where on shell means on shell of the bare action. So perturbations of the action that vanish on shell do not contribute to the S matrix. Okay? Clearly this term vanishes on shell and this term vanishes on shell, it's on shell but this term doesn't. That's why this term contributes to the S matrix. Okay? So now we understand from this point of view why at four derivative levels there was only one action. And there was one, only one S matrix. Because up to field redefinitions or up to unshell terms, there was only one four derivative action we could have written down. Okay? And that is going to generate the three derivative, the four derivative scattering amplitude for Einstein. And if you just work out what this is, that gives you the four derivative amplitude. Actually, I'm written in this form, it looks a bit complicated, but I'm going to give you another another form for this amplitude that I've never seen published actually, but I'll tell you what it is. This amplitude can be written nicely in the following way. Define the following five form. Epsilon 1 wedge epsilon. I'm going back to A's zeta zeta prime. Define the five form zeta 1 wedge zeta 2 wedge zeta 3 wedge k1 wedge k2. This is some five form. Okay, take this five form and square it. Meaning this is some five form which I'll call F alpha, beta, gamma. If wedge star F. Yeah, F wedge star F, exactly. Uh, delta, theta, whatever. F 
wedge alpha, beta, gamma, delta, beta. This is what I want to do. Okay. Now, this is clearly a scalar. It's clearly linear both in zeta and zeta prime. For all three, because it's got zeta 1, zeta 2, zeta 3, and zeta prime 1, zeta prime 2, zeta prime 3. When I say this is F tilde. Now, is it gauge invariant? Yes, it is. Because if zeta 1 goes to zeta 1 plus k1, I have a k1 which k1, which gives 0. What about zeta 3 goes to zeta 3 plus k3? k3 is minus of k1 plus k2. So once again, you get 0. And you might think, OK, it's a bit odd. We had three zetas, but we put only two k's. Why did we put only two k's? If we try to put the third k, we would get 0. Because k1, k2, k3 are not linearly independent. And does it matter if I chose k1, k2, or k1, k3? No, it doesn't matter. Because if I chose k1, k3, up to sine, it doesn't matter. Because k3 is equal to minus of k1 plus k2. The k1, k1 is 0. They once again get k2. There's some sine issue, but anyway, we're squaring. So up to, you know. There's basically a unique choice if you want to take such a wedge product. There's a unique thing that you can do. OK? This, if you work this out, you work out the forward derivative term that we've got from this, you will find that it can be rewritten as this square. Uh, and an, a nice thing about, I mean, there's something nice about this form. And uh, uh, this is the scattering amplitude of, uh, of the term that comes from R alpha beta gamma delta. Now, I said it's the term that comes from R alpha beta gamma delta, but people will often say the following. This is the scattering amplitude from the gauss bonnet term. So what is the gauss bonnet term? The gauss bonnet term is some linear combination of R squared, R mu nu, R mu nu, and R alpha beta gamma delta. OK? Uh, we could use our field definitions to set these to whatever we wanted. So at the level of calculations, or you know, since these don't contribute. At the level of calculations, this is the same as saying it's the, uh, it's the, uh, uh, it's the scattering amplitude from R alpha beta gamma delta R, R alpha beta gamma delta. OK, but uh, uh, right, it's the same. But why do people say gauss bonnet rather than Riemann square? And there's an interesting reason for that. You know, the gauss bonnet form is chosen. You see, these terms are quadratic in R. So apart from modifying the three-point function and four-point function and everything else, they will also, in general, modify the propagator of the, uh, of the graviton. Now what kind of propagator modifications could we have? It would have to be a propagator modification that makes the graviton propagator at large k scale like k to the four, uh, one by k to the four. Because, you know, if you modify, we had one by k square from Einstein. And then um, it will be some, the kinetic term will be sort of schematically k square plus k to the 4. Then you invert that. At large k, the k to the 4 term dominates. And so we'll go like 1 by k to the 4. But you know there's a problem. And the problem is this, that how can a propagator ever scale like 1 by k to the 4? Yeah, I mean, I would have thought that the leading term dictates what the next term will scale like. I mean, the leading term uh, dictates uh, the propagator will be 1 over k square and the subleading will. Yeah, it's subleading. So now it's a question of how you're treating this B. A, B, C will come somewhere. So B, uh, B is length, so this will be, let's say, like one of these coefficients. Let's call it B, in B prime, some linear combination of A, B, C. will come here. But it's a fixed number. OK, so now, of course, if you work in perturbation theory in B prime, this propagator will have all kinds of properties. But what I'm saying is, suppose we take this seriously for a moment, this action seriously, at finite B. Then we get a kinetic term that's k square plus B prime k to the 4, schematically. Therefore, oh, sorry, this kinetic term, therefore, propagator will be like yes. this. And then, no matter how small B is, there'll always be k that's large enough. So that the propagator at large k will scale like 1 over k to the 4. OK, now, if that happens, it is often, or more or less always, possible to partial factorize this 
into two terms with one over k square. But how can it be that you have two terms which have one over k square, but the, the large, large order k behavior is one over k to the four? It can only be if the coefficients of the two terms are equal, equal and opposite. But you know, when you have a one over k square, the coefficient of that has to be positive in a theory that has unitarity. Because uh, it's the amplitude for producing a particle. And the other is a ghost. The other is some ghost particle. So if you try to make a theory in general with these three structures, you know where, just on general grounds, before you start doing any calculations, then if you take this theory seriously, not part of the first few terms in an expansion which goes on forever, but just seriously, it stops that. Then you know you're going to land up with a theory that cannot be unitary because it has wrong sign propagated, wrong sign, wrong sign poles. Okay? So if we're going to take this theory seriously at all, and you know, you may or may not want to. In string theory, it's not the end of the story. Hey, uh, we'll discuss this in a moment. In string theory, it's not the end of the story. But if we were to take it seriously, I mean, you can ask, is there a combination of ABC that does not, such that the effect of the propagator cancels out? There's no k to the four term in the propagator. Particular kind of gauge fixing in a way. Uh, Not gauge fixing. It's just choice of coefficients. No, I mean, uh, to, to see, uh, not to see this unphysical mode. Uh, and uh, no, no, wait. it's a it's a physical choice. You see, mm -hmm. the choice of A, B, C. Okay, you see, at first order, for the purpose of capturing amplitudes, we've seen this, no difference. But now we're not doing first order, right? We're taking it very seriously. We're allowing, for instance, for this problem, we're allowing this term to dominate this term. So now, imagine that we've got A, B, C as fixed constants, and we take the theory seriously, not perturbatively in A, B, C, but at finite A, B, C. Then, the theories with different choices of A and B and C are just different theories. Yes. And there is a particular choice of A, B, C, a particular linear combination, namely this gauss bonnet combination in which the modification of the prop prop uh, propagator just vanishes. So the propagator remains that of Einstein gravity. Are there two structures or one? What? No, it's just, there is one, uh, there is a unique linear combination. One linear, one linear combination. No, no one mean, linear combination. So it's just the overall scale is. Overall scale. No. And yeah, I'm given A is one, B and C, B and C are, are fixed. fixed. Right? That is that linear combination is this gauss bonnet combination. Okay? So it's a beautiful linear combination which has this, this property that does not have unphysical poles in the propagator. So one could try to take this theory seriously as a starting point for quantizing gravity rather than Einstein. Not that it's going to work. But at least at first order one could take it seriously. Okay? Because this has this nice property, people like to say that this scattering amplitude, the four directors scattering amplitude, is the scattering amplitude from gauss bonnet theory. Okay, so now I've tried to explain to you what that four point structure that we get in string theory is. Any questions or comments before we continue? Yes. Okay. Now, if you want to do that field redefinition and then do this analysis, you think? Yeah. Then you will have to take into account. You see, the field redefinition will not stop at producing fourth order terms. It will produce terms of all orders. Because R is not in you know, a linear. Also, the field redefinition has not been done accurately because we should also do the re redefinition on these guys. So what I did at the beginning was for the limited purposes of working to first order in the coefficient. The analysis of the propagator was not that limited purpose, right? Because it was allowing this term to dominate over this term. To we work to first order, we have to first take this to zero. Then can never dominate over that. Okay? So but if you do that, you will still get the propagator to be fine. We know that on general grounds because field redefinition don't, don't change properties. Okay, but it will be a very hard calculation in the new, 
It will be some miracle. <laughs> the miracle would be explained by the field reduction. Is this clear? Any more questions for that? What? How do I make it non-physical? Non unitary Let me say this again. See, we should really do it. Suppose we have, suppose we have a structure of one variable x. X is sort of like k square. Okay, one variable x, which is x to the four, which is x square. X is like k square. Uh, x plus a x square. Now, what I'm going to do is, uh, now this, you see this term here has two poles. Okay, that is 1 over x, uh, 1 over x times a, a pole at x and a pole at uh, 1 by a. Now, I want to make these two poles manifest. So, I'll work it out in partial fractions. Okay, so it's going to be zeta 1 by x plus zeta 2 by 1 plus ax. So let's check what zeta 1, zeta 2 are. So we have zeta 1 into 1 plus ax plus zeta 2 into x has to be equal to 1. Right? So first thing we see is that the, a, uh, the x terms cancel. So zeta 2 is equal to minus a. Right? So that the x terms cancel. So zeta 2 is equal to, so the zeta into minus a. Minus a and zeta 1 has to be, uh, has to be 1. Okay. So, so zeta 2 was equal to minus a and zeta 1 was equal to 1. So what do we get? We get 1 over x minus a over 1 plus ax. Now, let's look at this. This the, we should really write with x minus something. So this is minus of x plus, plus 1 by a. Now look at this. This pole came with one sign, but this pole came with the other. So if this is a physically, you know, if you have a kinetic term, let's say you are a minimally coupled scalar field, there is one sign of kinetic term that gives you unitarity and the other sign that does not. That sign reflects in the propagator. So this one is the unitary sign, this one cannot be. Now, you might say, well, this was one example. How do I know this will always happen? I know it will always happen for a general reason. That when I do this partial fractionation, unless the coefficient, and then I take x to infinity. What I will get is that the net coefficient of 1 by x is the residues, is, I mean is the numbers here, some of the numbers. But we know that those have to add up to 0. Because as x goes to infinity, it doesn't behave like 1 over uh, 1 over x, it behaves like 1 over x to the 4, uh, 1 over x squared. So it can't be that all the terms, all the coefficients are positive. So it's a general feature, you will see this theorem somewhere in studies of quantum field theory. Um, it follows from the Lehman representation theorem. Any unitary quantum field theory, propagators of particle type fields, okay, have to decay at infinity like 1 by k square. Cannot decay faster than that for this reason, basically this reason. Okay, so turning on higher derivatives is usually in, you're putting yourself in grave tension of losing unitarity. Okay, and if you try to uh, work with a theory that is only four derivative and take it seriously, not as first term in an infinite series, then just this consideration forces you into the Gauss body action. Is this clear? Any any other questions or comments? Okay. So, uh, given that uh, we could have uh, something like this, uh, at this of that Kyle's unitarity. That could be remedied order by order by. It could uh, be remedied order by order. Absolutely, that could be done. Because, you know, uh, we are taking k to infinity, so all terms will contribute. 
So, if we've got higher order terms, we can't neglect them for this purpose. But I was just asking the limited question, suppose we had a term that was just one error. Can we make, can we make it non-problematic by itself? May or may not be a physical question, but clearly it's, if there is a combination, that's the one you want to deal with. <laughs> okay, now this is the Gauss Bunny comp. Is this clear? Okay, finally there's the sixth derivative term. Got. So, I mean, uh, so Gauss Bonnet term is uh, usually some topological term, right? I mean, it's topological in four dimensions. Okay. In five and higher dimensions, it's not topological, and it affects the S matrix. So, in fact, you can check that the uh, the S matrix that follows from here in four dimensions, the four derivative part is trivial. But you have to use the fact that in four dimensions, um, you know, so, yeah. See. When, when you're doing scattering, when you're doing, uh, in fact, it's obvious from here. Can you see this? Five form in four. There's no five form in five, four, four dimensions. Hmm. Right. So in four dimensions, that that way of writing it manifestly gives you zero. Hmm. Now it's a way of writing it that doesn't look like it's zero, but once you've written it like this, it's obviously zero. Because. So it, it could be interesting in five. 5 or any higher dimension. No, I mean, because in 5D, it's uh, probably just the volume form. I mean, the only unique. Uh, 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 yeah, I mean, it's, it's the square of a volume form. Okay. So, what you're saying is that in 5 dimensions, we could have imagined some sort of scattering amplitude for vector particles, which was not the whole thing square, hmm. but the form itself. Right. This would be a parity violating. Scattering amplitude for gauge bosons in five dimensions, and you're correct. Okay, but for gravitons, it doesn't matter because anyway we're squaring it. So it's not a form; we're integrating a scalar. Okay, good. Um, now, other questions about this? Okay, now let's turn to the sixth derivative term. The sixth derivative term is comes more simply okay it comes more simply uh, as r a b c d just a contraction of three remarks now and uh, because of all the symmetries of riemann is there just one unique contraction mm, uh, and that's what you might think but the actual answer is no oh. okay <laughs> <laughs> okay if you classify all the on-shell inequivalent contractions of Riemanns, you do the exercise, you get two. The answer is two. There are in any dimension. Any dimension. Well, I'm, there may be something special in low enough dimension. Certainly higher than a minimum dimension. Okay. You get two distinct. But you can show that one linear combination of the two in expansion in H starts out at fourth order. Which means that both these structures give rise to the same three graviton scattering amplitudes. Actually, Indranil, Shubham, Lavneet, Abhijit, and I we are writing a paper which makes many of these points. Uh, many of these points clear. This what I've just said can't be new. Somebody knows it, but in the course of writing our paper, we're making these points very clear. Okay, so uh, um, fine. So this is the reason, it's a bit non-intuitive in this case. This is the reason why, uh, in fact, uh, okay, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter, it, it doesn't matter, we, I won't get into more detail. But uh, th this is the reason why the six derivative structure, even though there are three inequivalent contractions of Riemann, uh, two inequivalent contractions of Riemann. Uh, there's only one three-point function because it's some sort of miracle that the ex that even though they non at the non-linear level they're dis different structures. When you expand it at three-point order, they actually are the same. So that some linear combination of the two vanishes. Just some coincidence. Okay, uh, I could explain to you how to ex understand all this more in more detail, but that'll take us too far. So let's 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 make this statement and move on. And so the th third structure, the sixth derivative structure that you get from the term I rubbed out the alpha prime by eight, 
kkk. That's the structure that you get from this Riemann. It's just a very simple structure. Okay, any uh, further questions or comments before we continue? Okay, great. Which them? Ah, very good question. What about the R cube and unitarity? Well, there's a very simple answer to that. R cube cannot affect the propagator because this expansion starts out at three, uh, three expansion because each Riemann is zero in flat space. So it can, cannot affect the propagator. It can only affect scattering amplitudes. And this unitarity issue, the way we try to uh, analyze it, was one involving propagators, so it has no effect on it. Okay. However, there's a deeper question of whether these terms are allowed in a way that, allow, that affects causality, unitarity, and so on. That has not been completely studied. Unitarity what? Unitarity no, 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 no. Unitarity is a unitarity, right? It's the fact that the quantum theory has a Hermitian Hamiltonian that generates. Okay. It has some implications for propagators, but it goes well beyond. At that some point, level, uh, wasn't it, I mean, I don't know the details, wasn't it studied by Maldasen and Jubadev? Exactly. So Maldasen and Jubadev basically argued uh, that, uh, uh, that if these, for instance, one of the things they argue is that if the theory just stops here, if the theory just stops here, then you can show that causality forces you to turn all three coefficients off. Okay. Meaning even the gauss bonnet coefficient, for instance, would have to be zero. And sorry, not just here, here and the Riemann cubed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so at the three point five, yeah, if you had a th something that was literally a Lagrangian, that had two derivative, four derivative, and six derivative terms, then lack of, lack of ghosts, Plus causality tells you that the only allowed theory is Einstein, is Einstein graphite. Yeah. 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 Six derivative you mean? Three R terms can huh? be realized, four R terms after making a field redefinition. But it, it might, the field redefinition might write it as infinitely. So the term, so this, this is the nice term, right? The, the one that ha does not affect the three-point function. But not quite, because it's six derivative. Four R is always eight derivative. So derivatives on this are four R or not. Uh, I'm saying that it does not have any three-point structure, so can a point not be redefinition? Well, maybe something non-local. But anything involving four R's that is local would have to start at eight derivative order. Yeah, so by non-local you mean all, 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 all R's? Right? No, no, I mean just the four R term itself would have to have a one by del square. just to get the dimensions right. right yeah. So you can't write that original term as a local 4R term. But there's a sense in which what you're saying is true, as you know well. What, what is true is that every derivative structure that you write on it mm -hmm. can be written in terms of 4Rs. Yes. And so there is a sense in which this term can be written as 4R with a one by derivative. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make the point this term is, so here the kind of structures you are looking at is like, Stops and let's say six derivative or yes. four derivatives. This term is in some sense is like all our derivatives. This is roughly. Uh, well, it's but in derivative counting, it is six derivative. Yes, sir, there is a way of writing it as six derivatives. Uh, in homogeneity, let's say the coefficient of the term behind it has four powers of length compared to the coefficient behind Einstein. That is an exact statement. Yes, but it's true that. There is a sense in which its index structure is more like that of a, uh, an eight derivative term. But, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, I know, but it's, as you know, this very interesting structure. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, yeah, you want to learn more about this structure and its consequences, you can read our beautiful upcoming paper. <laughs> okay, yeah. What? Huh? 
if the theory ends there. If the theory goes on, all bets are off. As we will see in, in today's lecture, as we will see in today's lecture, in the boson, in the type 2 string, none of these structures are there. But in the heterotic string, the four directive structure is there. Yet the heterotic string is perfectly consistent with causality. Huh? And the reason that it is, is that it doesn't end there. So, uh, uh, yep. Yeah, I mean, just a question. Uh, because of the string dualities, I mean, all the string theories are related to each other, but in one string uh, theory, this structure does not appear in uh, another, it does appear. How do we reconcile that? You see, what we are talking about is the three level effective action. Now, how does duality work? Duality takes strong coupling at one end to weak coupling at the other. So, suppose I have got earth theory. I have got earth theory which is here. Okay, I have got a parameter set of theories. This is zero coupling, this is infinitely strongly coupling. What we are saying is that at this end there is a classical expansion where the term does not appear. At that end there is an expansion where it does appear. There is no claim that we can compare if two theories have dual that their classical theories have to be the same. In fact, that is not true in usual, in general, right? Right. Ah, uh, okay. Uh, um, more, 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 more questions about this. So let me make one more statement about. Yeah, this is just to position the general structure. But now then we'll go on to the type two and heterotic string. But uh, uh, let me make one more general positioning comment. And that is, so far our string S matrix, okay, has allowed us to compute the terms in the effective action that scale like Riemann Q up to Riemann Q. I mean, our, our, th our three point S, uh, coupling, uh, ca uh, three point scattering has allowed us to access terms that scale up to Riemann Q. If we have a term that scales like Riemann to the four or Riemann to the five, uh, the calculation we've done so far is blind to it. Because uh, uh, it will not contribute to three, three graviton scattering. Okay. On the other hand, once we calculate four graviton scattering, we will then gain access to terms that scale like Riemann to the four. When we compute five graviton scattering, we'll get access to terms that scale like Riemann to the five, and so on. Now, now, uh, I told you that the that the uh, um, that the uh, um, Three point scatterings of gravitons were kinematically basically three possible structures. Now, this must mean that there is some sense in which the Riemann cube, cube terms in the action is limited to three possible structures. We've written the three, uh, well, we've written the three down this <coughs> Einstein, Gauss, Bernier, and this other Riemann cube. But something sounds odd here because you see there are two different expansions. There's expansions in powers of amplitude, which is essentially how many powers of the Riemann tensor you have. And there's expansion in derivatives. And these are not the same thing, because a given Riemann tensor can have many der extra derivatives on it. Now, what would such a thing do to S matrices? Well, so suppose I had some phi, 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 del mu, del mu. What is the S matrix that comes from this term compared to the S matrix of just phi, 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 phi? Well, you'll get, a, if, if we call the momentum in this field K1, momentum in this field K2, you'll get an extra factor of K1 dot K2, which is a factor of S, essentially. Okay? So, when you have four particles, extra derivatives, the fact that we could have had function worths of S matrices translates into the fact that we could have uh, you know, the, the Lagrangian statement is that you can put derivatives all over on the fields. On the other hand, we know that there are no invariants in three particle scattering. So, suppose I take, let's say, our Riemann cube structure, this one, this, and I put this, it must give me three point scattering zero. Just because there's no eight derivative term allowed for three point scattering. Now, how can this work at Lagrangian level? The most reasonable way it can work is there's some Lagrangian manipulation 
that allows you to manipulate this into a four hour stretch. Okay? And one can show that that's always the case. That putting derivatives under the integral sign, putting derivatives on these, on these, uh, 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 on these three Riemann or less than three Riemann structures can always be manipulated. Actually, let's say it's for three Riemann can always be manipulated to a four hour stretch. Do you have some constraints? Bianchi identity, commutator of two derivatives is an R, that kind of thing. Okay? So you are saying only independent combination, what can be possible is without tails. Exactly. And that maps to the fact that there are only three S matrices, three three point S matrices. So everything else interesting, you see, there is this one level, namely three, point, three terms in amplitude where the derivative expansion is essentially trivial. Because the only way of adding additional derivatives for Einstein theory is by effectively turning it into a four point amplitude, you know, four R. The question of how many R's there are is a bit ambiguous. Because, you know, you can take two derivatives and make a commutator of that and get an R. So once you're allowing derivatives, how many powers of Riemann there are is, is ambiguous. But how many powers of amplitude you need before the S matrix is non-zero is not unambiguous. So whether something contributes to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the uh, three po uh, to four points scattering uh, to three points scattering or not is an unambiguous question. Now, if you have something that does not contribute to three-point function but is eight derivative, it's plausible it can be written in terms of four R's because that manifestly does not contribute to three-point scattering, and you can show that that's basically always the case. This kind of thing Indra Neil was referring to. Okay? So, at the level of three amplitudes, three point functions, the derivative effective, understood correctly, the effective expansion of, der uh, of uh, effective expansion of the action is very simple. It's finite number of terms at the level of three Riemanns. Okay? At the level of four Riemanns, we know that we're going to get vast numbers of terms. Because S matrices can have arbitrary functions of STU, as we discussed last time. All these will be in equivalent. So, three point functions and Lagrangians with only three Riemanns understood correctly. You know, you understand that the statement is a bit ambiguous, but understood correctly, very simple. Four point functions is where all hell breaks loose. Okay? Because now we have functional ambiguity in the S matrices. Or equivalently, arbitrarily complicated ways of dressing once you uh, Riemanns with derivatives that contract with each other. Okay, and that's where that's where uh, uh, that's where there's a lot of fun to be had. Um, but okay, let's 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 stop them. Okay, so at the moment, what we have probed in some way, rather completely, is the. Uh, structure of the Lagrangian up to three derivative order. I mean three Riemann order. Okay? We understand the full scattering matrix, so in some sense we understand the full Lagrangian. Not, but it was very trivial. Okay? When we compute the four point function, which will be either this class or the next one, um, when we compute the four point function in string theory, we will start probing for Riemann, and then things will be much less trivial. Here, basically all we are computing some numbers behind structures we could have predicted before. There we will get, you know, new structures, or new, uh, much more interesting stuff. Like okay, um, questions or comments? You can write something which is two R's and L's. So the, the same kind of argument that I told you about, it says two R's and L's can always be promoted to a three R structure. And three R's and L's can always be promoted to a four R structure. But four hours and delts cannot always be promoted to five hours. It stops at four. Okay? And this in S matrix language is why is four special? It's the first place where you have functional freedom. I mean, is it in general true that for arbitrary value of Jimmy uh -huh. tail square of R is some linear combination of Well, you know, I'm doing things only up to terms that vanish by integration by uh, so a total derivative. So del square by r, del square of r is zero. 
Yeah. So when I make these statements, I'm saying within the Lagrangian. I'm allowing myself to if integrate by parts. It is, if it is not perturbative, then, then it is. No, in general, in, in general. general true. True. So non-linear statements. Okay. Up to boundary. Up to, yeah, up to terms that, but there are non-linear statements you can make. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So now, now that we understand this, this, you see, this little calculation with the bosonic string already has led us to understanding a lot of, uh, to a lot of physics, right? It's much nicer than the last 10 lectures or so, you're doing formalism, formalism. <laughs> okay, yeah. Uh, so now we've come to the fun part of the course. <laughs> where, where, where we're trying to make contact with physics. I mean, there'll be some people who say that what we're doing is not, that scattering in 26 <laughs> dimensions is not physics, but they're wrong, right? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, excellent. Um, um, okay, so this was the bosonic string. Now let us try to compute what we get from three gravitons scattering in type two string. Let us remember. Let us remember what the vertex operators for uh, the three graviton scattering. Uh, for the gravitons. Well, there was the, what was it, minus one or one? Picture. Minus one. There was the minus one picture in which the vertex operator was e to the power uh, phi times time mu. You remember? In this minus one picture, um, let us remember the weight of e to the power minus r, a phi was equal to, what was it, what was it, what was it? Does somebody remember this? I'll have to look it up from, of course there's a squared by 2. Oh, let me look it up. Well, it's a squared by 2 plus a, something like that, right? Just give me the numbers. What? Ah, e to the power l phi, a phi has minus a squared by 2 plus uh, plus a. Minus a. Hmm. Yeah, why did it have minus a squared by 2? It's because e to the power i. No, but that is for a phi. What? A plus, a. plus a. Plus a, plus a, sorry. Plus. Why, why is this minus here? It's because e to the power i k had alpha prime k squared by 4. And now we're working with the uh, Alpha prime is equal to 2, so that's k squared by 2, but with that factor of i is on there, that's why the minus. And then this is the, because of the linear Dilettan term. Right. Now, let's remember, so this operator then with a is equal to minus 1 has minus 1 by 8, minus 1, sorry, minus half, uh, minus, plus 1, which is equal to half. The Sieg Hosted dimension, minus 1. So totally e to the power minus phi plus c goes as dimension minus half. So we need a primary operator uh, which has uh, dimension half and psi mu as the candidate. You remember this. Okay, so in the minus one picture we had, this was the amplitude. Now you might be tempted to write e to the power minus phi. Think that we have to do zeta one mu zeta zeta 1 mu zeta 2 mu zeta 3 rho e to the power minus phi e to the power minus mu z1 z2 psi rho z3. You might be t uh, tempted to think that this is what we should be calculate. This is not correct. Tell me, somebody tell me why this is not correct. Times of course. No, 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 not like this. Oh. 
The anti-symmetry will go away when we multiply with the, with the uh, right hand side as well. I mean, no, but there's much more fundamental reason. No, 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 no. No, no, it's a reason just a formalism. What were our rules for string per, super string perturbation theory? Somebody remembers? On the sphere, what should the net picture number be? Two of them. The net picture number had to be minus two. Because otherwise, the integral over the zero mode of, the, of phi would kill you. Do you remember? Right? We have this nice selection rule that the net insertions of phi had to have a certain charge, which depended on the genus. But when the genus was a sphere, that charge was minus two. So we are not allowed to use this. We have to use this with an additional picture changing operator. Now we're good. Now we, we can take this picture changing operator to any one of these guys. Let's say we take it towards psi 3. And we know that what that does is give us this zero picture vertex operator. And you remember that the zero picture vertex operator was just the action of g minus half on O, so in this case on psi mu. Okay, so let me work this out in state language. We can also work it out in operator language. We do both. In state language, what is the state corresponding to psi mu? Well, it's just psi mu to the power mi minus half. Well, the NS sector, remember. Okay, this whole discussion is the NS sector. So psi mu minus half is the state corresponding to psi mu. Now, g minus half, well, let's remember what g minus half was. It was the current coming from del x psi mu. G was the super partner of the stress tensor, the dimension 3 half super partner of the stress tensor. OK? So if we expand this out in modes, what will we get? There'll be it'll be schematically alpha times psi. The modes will have to add up to minus half. So what kind of terms could we have? We could have an alpha minus one, psi half. And we can have an alpha uh, zero, psi minus half. Yeah, of course, we'll have many other terms. But all of the other terms will have at least one annihilation operator that is not psi minus half, that is not psi half. We're allowed to have annihilation with psi half because that can kill the state. Okay, but if we have an annihilation, let's say with psi three halves, that, 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 I'm saying annihilation with psi half will kill the psi minus half without giving us zero. But if you had an annihilation operator with psi three halves acting on the, the state, we'll get zero. So the, in the infinite expansion for g minus half, these are the only terms that matter. I'm not keeping the numbers very carefully. We'll read the numbers out from Kulchinsky later. I'm just really giving you the sense of the terms we'll get. Okay, now what happens when this acts on that? We get alpha mu minus one on zero because the psi half kills the psi minus half. What happens when this acts on this? Well, we get plus, um, let's call this theta or oh, zeta. Alpha dot psi minus half, psi mu minus half, one zero, alpha zero. But alpha zero is k, up to some i's and alpha primes and so on. That's going to be the source of i's and alpha primes. So now I'll uh, read, I'll give you the thing with the, with the right numbers. So the zero, picture vertex operator I actually find Pulchinsky's organization of this material very non-intuitive you can never find where all his formulas um, where does he do pictures for instance chapter 12 ah here here uh, I del X <laughs> Uh, well, let me give it to you in state language first. Plus, ah, this in uh, 
in alpha naught language came actually with these with these coefficients, but let's, what we're really interested in is operator, so we have to trans, this will translate now to what, what vertex operator does this translate to on the state operator map? Del x mu, what does this translate to? Psi minus half, psi minus half? What's the state dual, uh, operator dual to psi minus half? Come on. It's psi, psi. Psi is a dimension half field. It produces, you remember this, right? Uh, so plus k dot psi into psi mu, and now with some factors, and I'll tell you the factors. Um, half alpha prime. And there's an i. This is the zero picture vertex operator. Uh, all these factors came from the fact that alpha zero and uh, k differed by funny factors. Uh, is this clear? Uh, let's just as a um, just as a two-minute exercise, let's work this out also in operator language. G was equal to let's let's so let's say we take psi, uh, psi mu del x mu, and let's expand this out in a mode expansion. So this will be equal to G into G R divided by z to the power three halves plus r, where r is half integer, right? Okay, so how, how do we get GR? Oh, let's just specify, specialize to G half the one we want. What, what do we have to do to this to get G, um, G half? Well, if we want half here, this power is two. Okay, so Z times, um, uh, psi mu del x mu at z and then we want to put the operator that we already had which was psi of 0 and we want to see what operator that becomes at 0. This is the contour integral. Okay, so now what we want is the uh, pole in z when we take this, uh, when we take this expansion. Okay, so uh, let's see. Um, right? G, G, I want G minus half, right? G minus half. So I, I, I put half here. Sorry. So this this is a one. So there's no z, right? So I, I, I want g minus half is equal to this. G minus half on psi. The op is going to be this operator. Okay. So now what we know, what is the is the uh, is the overall pole? Okay. So one term that we get is when we take this guy with this guy. Um, so that will give us, um, that will give us del x mu of z by z and that was this. And where are we going to get this? Ah, and I've forgotten that there was also an e to the pi k dot x. We had psi, but also momentum, right? So one pole we get is when the the, uh, the contraction of psi zero with psi zero. That's del x that gives us this term. But we also get uh, a contraction of this guy with this guy. That gives us again a pole, right? Because we get a log from x with x, but del x makes it a pole. 
that pole has coefficient i k. Okay, um, and uh, uh, then we just set these two both to zero, so that uh, the term that was was this, and uh, we can actually calculate the relative coefficient also here, uh, because this was accurate. This was just one over z, and this relative coefficient will be what? It'll be i k. Then there is a minus alpha prime by two, minus alpha prime by two. And uh, um, then we take the derivative. Uh, so okay, up to some plus minus sign, but but you see that we've got all the factors right up to a possible sign. Okay, so that's the usual story. If you want to do real calculations, it's better to work in operator language than this. This because here you have to keep track of various things. Operator language is just to keep track of the op. Op is very simple to remember. Okay, so you see that if we worked in operator language, we would also get g minus alpha and psi is equal to this operator. It's, a, it's the better way to work in my opinion. Is this clear? So now if we, oops, I will, before the office staff goes out to, I'm, uh, by the way, I'm away for 10 days, I'm away, next two weeks basically. I, we'll have class Friday two weeks from now because I'm out of town. But I'm gonna have to end class in 10 minutes because I haven't managed to put in my leave application yet. I have to do, <laughs> do it before the office goes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, uh, uh, so now let us continue. Okay. So, this is what we naively thought, but then we added the picture changing operator. And what did that do? What we have understood is that what that did was to change this insertion to i del x3 z3 plus alpha prime by 2 k3 dot psi, psi mu. That is the amplitude we really have to compute. Is this clear? Okay. Now, uh, now this computation can be broken up into two calculations. Either you take this, this with this, or this, this with this. Let's do the first one. Okay. If we take this, this with this, then this is just a two-point function in the psi theorem. So that's one over z, one, two. Then it's a two-point function in the phi theorem. Okay, now the two point function in the phi theory was minus one into minus one into mm, uh, minus log. So e to the power minus log z12. Did I get that right? Uh, phi phi, let's remember phi phi is equal to, in general is minus alpha prime by two, this is like half, so minus log, and there are two minus signs from here, so that looks right to me. Okay, so that gives another one over z12. Good. And then what, what is left is this guy. Now this guy gave a factor of, you remember the, the, the general rule, it had i k j over z 3 j sum over j. Okay, and uh, uh, here we had of course a delta mu nu. That came from the contraction of psi with psi. And this term gave this, this, this factor uh, with a, um, this is a del x rho. Is this clear? Now let's simplify this term. Once again, we use that this rho 
So this is what? It's I k1 rho by z31 plus k2 rho by z32. Exactly like the calculation we did last class, right? OK, so this is i, 1 over z31, z32. And then we get z32 plus z31. But in contracting with psi 3, k2 is the same as minus k1. So it's z31 minus z, z32 minus z31. So that up to some sign is z12. And then up to a factor of half is k12 dot uh, k12 rho. And maybe a half. I may have got a sign wrong. OK? So the net factor is what? We've got delta mu nu by z12, z23, z13 times k12 rho. Now, interestingly enough, this exactly cancels the contractions of the, the three Cs. So this term by itself is Z invariant. It does not depend where we've inserted our vertex operators. That's great. But we've got this strange looking result. It's a nice result except that it looks completely unsymmetric because it's special. It, one and two are treated as special and three is different. I mean, or maybe I should say three is treated as special, one or two are and on equal footing but are different. But you know, we've only done half of the calculation. There's the other half to do. Okay, now in this other half of the calculation, what are we going to get? Notice that here we had k12. Notice that here we're going to get a k3 dot something. Okay, now, okay, let's quickly do that calculation. In order to do that, we need the four point function of four size. Okay? Um, this, the end point function of m, the m point function of m size, I don't know if you remember, but sometime last, at the end of the last, last semester, we'd written out a general formula. Do you remember we'd written out the formula based on the fact that it has to have zeros when two sides come together? Uh, but poles when size and side bars come together, that kind of thing. Uh, that kind of thing. So we've written down a general formula. Just use that general, okay, I'm going to leave this as an exercise for you. Use that general formula, compute this. In the end, what you will see is that this just gets completed to the symmetric expression. So this term here will be completed at k23 dotted with, mm, no, k23 dotted with mu and a k13 dotted with mu. That will come with, with these contractions. You can more or less see how it's going to work, right? You'll get this contracting with this or this contracting with this. There'll be basically two weak contractions. And you can see how it's going to work, right? So you just use Wick's theorem. You know, it's a simple calculation. What you will get is that this thing will be completely symmetrized. Now, do you recognize what this is? When we wrote down the V tensor, well, what was it, the T tensor? We had a one derivative term and a three derivative term. This is simply the one derivative part of the T tensor. Okay? So the net result is that let's define a tensor V mu nu rho, which is equal to this and symmetrized. So K12 rho eta mu nu plus k23 um, k23 mu eta nu rho plus k31 uh, nu eta mu rho remember the t tensor was this so t mu nu rho was equal to v mu nu rho plus alpha prime by 8 k23 mu k 3, 1, new k, uh, 1, 3, new, oops, 3, 1, 
is new and one uh, sorry two three three one and one two one two no. so what we get is the one derivative part of what we got for the bosonic string okay excellent so now what does this tell us about scattering of three gravitons in the superstring what only square root gr the full structure is only the two derivative part the term that was gauss bernay in the six derivative term was absent so the type 2 superstring we are learning has this property that its expansion that the effective action of the type 2 superstring okay starts at Riemann to the power 4 so Einstein plus Riemann to the 4 that's why it's not affecting I mean, this itself does not say that I mean, it could start at even a higher order right I mean, it could start at higher order yes but we will see that it starts at Riemann to the 4 because the 4 point scattering will be completely and entirely non trivial okay or at least more accurately there is a choice of field redefinition in which it starts at r to the power no choice of field in which that is true excellent now uh, I, I went through this a bit fast but it was clear right were, were there any questions or comments anything that was unclear Okay, now next question for you guys: How will three graviton scattering be in the in the heterotic string? Anyone? Well, what is the heterotic string? What is the structure of the heterotic string? See, how did we get these answers? We got them from a left moving part and a right moving part. In the heterotic string, let's say the left moving part is the supersymmetry, uh, the type 2 theory. The right moving string is? Bosonic string. So, what is the scattering amplitude going to be? We'll get one factor of this. And another factor of this. Okay. Then we'll have to symmetrize or anti-symmetrize depending on whether we're dealing with B or or, uh, or H. Let's say we symmetrize. So now can you tell me what will scattering amp three three graviton scattering amplitude look like in the heterotic string? GR and Gauss Bernay, but no Riemann cube. Okay. Because it's uh, uh, two derivative and four derivative, but no six derivative. So superstring is the worst. I'm oh, sorry, the, the bosonic string is the worst. It has all three possible three derivative, uh, all three possible structures. The type two string is beautiful. It doesn't mess around with Einstein until, until it has to. It's a beautiful structure, as you will see. As we will see, the f the four particle, four gravitons scattering in the type 2 string theory, the index structure of that is exactly like that of Einstein theory, even at 4 gravitons only, which is a highly non trivial string. And then it's m then it has an alpha prime expansion. So it's a little as, as uncomplicated as scalar scattering in some sense. I will explain this later. A type 2 theory is very beautiful. Okay. Uh, Heterotic string is less beautiful. Uh, it's got already we see some messing around with Einstein at three point scattering level. Bosonic string is just as generic as you can get. You could have had all three structures, you have all three structures. Okay, last two comments and then we'll stop. One, one comment goes as follows um, Notice that the full tensor structure is a product of a left moving structure and a right moving structure. That is inherent in the way these string theory calculations are done. 
because we've got a correlator on the left and a correlator on the right and they're not interfering except through overall momentum. Okay, so it will always be that at tree level, string scattering am amplitudes, product of something from the left and something from the right. Now, not all gauge invariant structures have this form. So something that comes as a product times product is somehow simple. And in order to understand the nature of that simplicity, uh, let's do the following exercise. Suppose we were doing the heterotic string. And we wanted to calculate the three part uh, sorry, sorry, three particle S matrix, not for three gravitons, but for three gauge bosons. Let me remind you, we went through the heterotic string in great detail. We, you remember there was the SO32 heterotic string, there was the E8 times E8 heterotic string. And you remember we spent a great deal of time talking about the vertex operators dual to the gauge bosons, the dimension one currents. Okay? So these dimension one currents, let's remember, came from the side of the heterotic string where, this, where the heterotic string was bosonic. For instance, in the uh, scalar language, it came from the lattice vector, latticization of the extra 16 dimension. The rule for the scattering amplitude there on the bosonic side is just C times vertex operator. The vertex operator in, in question here is the current itself, the dimension one currents which was going to be associated with gauge bosons. Okay, so what we're going to get there is C, J, 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 C, 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 J, J, J. <coughs> and, <coughs> and then we, on the left moving side, we'll just get a three point function of three j's. Now, each j is dimension one. We know that a, b, c, this is going to be proportional to f, a, b, c. We know this from our general study of current algebra. Since it's all dimension one, what, what are the possibilities for the, um, clearly it's going to be z1, 2, z, 2, 3, Z, 3, 1. So we get a dimension 3 structure at the end. Note that these are anti-symmetric, but this is anti-symmetric, so the whole thing's symmetric. I should be for 3 Js. And there'll be some number. So on the bosonic side, we would get this. But on the fermionic side, what will we get? What is the vertex operator for the gauge boson on the fermionic side? It's just this, right? On the fermionic side, the left moving uh, NS, NS sector, massless vertex operators were just this. So we will get this times a factor of V mu nu rho times zeta 1 mu, zeta 2 nu, zeta 3 rho. Okay, this is A1, if you want you can call this A1, A2, A3, maybe that's a better notation. So this will be the scattering amplitude for the three gauge bosons for the heterotic string up to some numbers which we are not computing very carefully. Is this clear? Okay, now this will cancel in the end, we have to do it a bit carefully. You have to check the phi's and the stuff. Okay, we'll do it and it cancels. Firstly, it cancels with the C's and the rest of the stuff cancels with themselves. Okay, it will happen. If, oh, actually, I, actually, this part has auto automatically canceled because on the left moving side, it's just Z1, 2, Z, Z2, 3, Z3, 4. And that, there was only C's. The Z tilde has cancel that we've already checked. Right, so actually there's no, it can be shown, we've seen it. The Z's cancel, Z tilde's cancel. So what we've got is this. This is our final amplitude. Now, what is this amplitude? This amplitude is what derivative order, firstly. One derivative. Can you tell me what kind of, uh, what kind of action for three gauge bosons would give you a non one derivative? Scattering amplitude. Just f mu nu, f mu nu itself. 
because f mu nu f mu nu has uh, has a part f has a part that is uh, linear and quartic one derivative no, I mean it should be two derivative yeah what's happening uh, what's happening what's happening what's happening what's happening Something's wrong. Just, just. A no, no, it's correct. It's correct, right? Because uh, f is like d a plus a square. It's no. yeah. I mean the three point uh, coupling. You exactly. So what the term that is cubic is uh, a d a with an a square. So one derivative and three a's. So we'll give you a one directive scattering amplitude. Okay, and it's very easy to check that this scattering amplitude here is what you will get from the angle sphere. Just ordinary Feynman diagrams will give you this B mu factor. In fact, this is something you've probably done in your field theory. It's five minutes. Okay, so you see that this V structure is very versatile. That same structure, when you get two of them, give you Einstein gravity. One of them gives you Yang-Mills theory. Notice that the dip, that Yang-Mills with a color factor, that V with a color factor gives you Yang-Mills, and V with V gives you Einstein. People, this, this fact which we've seen at tree level in string theory actually persists sometimes beyond tree level, sometimes at loop level in various theories and of late has become very popular. It's called color kinematics duality. It's related to the thing that's called color kinematics duality. That is, you can go from yang to gravity by replacing color factors by kinematics factors like this. Okay, uh, how general this is and how, what are the assumptions under which it follows is still being investigated. Uh, but it's a very simple, at the level of tree level scattering amplitude string theory, it's just there in your face, right? You just see it without doing basically any calculation. Okay, okay, I think we should stop here apart from the following exercises for you guys. So far, I have focused on computing three gravity on scattering. But as we said right at the beginning, l let's say the calculation we've done here in the superstring has in it not just three gravity on scattering, but three B, B mu nu, I mean, any three combination of dilaton, graviton, and B mu nu. Okay, and in fact, the answer that we have here is correct for all of them. V times V is the correct answer for all of them. You just have to choose whether the tensor that you contract with is symmetric traceless, anti-symmetric, or uh, pure trace. Okay, now, my exercise for you is to check which are the non-zero amplitudes. For instance, is dilaton, dilaton, dilaton non-zero? Is two dilatons and graviton non-zero? Is two dilatons and B mu nu non-zero? Is one dilaton, you know, all of that. Two B mu nu is one graviton. For instance, will, can one B mu nu and two gravitons be non-zero? What do you think? You know the rule, right? When you ask a question like this, it's the answer is usually yeah, no. Zero. <laughs> zero. <laughs> yeah, because having one anti-symmetric tensor contrast with a symmetric uh, faceless. Uh, one of them will source the others. Yeah. Or we can think about gauge invariance. So the B mu has its gauge gauge symmetry. So it has to enter the action through H. So it's H mu nu rho. Okay. Now how are we going to make a scalar coordinate invariant Lagrangian out of one H? Impossible. But may, out of two H's, very easy. Square root G. What will such a Lagrangian give you? It will give you two B's and one G. Okay. This Lagrangian will not give you three G, uh, three B's either. Okay. Now, if one were to try to make three B's, firstly, it's not going to be easy with the symmetric structure. But you need three H's. 
But in the super string, the whole amplitude was two derived. So we can't make it with more than two H's. So basically this must be it, right? So you should find that three B's is zero. Three B's with the themselves is zero. You should find two B's with G's non-zero. You should find one B with two G's. One B with anything is zero. Yes. And you'll see this very easily if you look at our tensor structure. What about the dilaton? The dil what 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 is what what Lagrangian would you like to write down for the dilaton? Two derivative. Everything is two derivative. Just square. Del phi, the whole thing square. Square root g. Now we could have added a phi square r. Nobody could have stopped us. Or even a phi r. Could have had. Could have a function of phi. Uh, that has a linear and quadratic term tends r. And in fact, in string theory, we will have an e to the power minus phi r. You will see in this this choice of field of, of, of field. But this is an example of a field redefini redefinition business. We can always get rid of this term at the expense. In the Einstein uh, exactly. wild, transformation. wild transformation. We'll come back to that maybe next. Next. Anyway, at the moment you just check. So this predicts that clearly two phi's with a metric has to be non-zero. But it also suggests that one phi with a metric will be non-zero. Okay? But um, now that one H two gravitons on two, 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 two uh, yeah. It will turn out that the effective action here also has the same e to the power minus phi. Maybe minus two phi in the usual. Uh, so we should also see one phi with two b's. All this check. Check all this and take your answers, construct a local Lagrangian that will be consistent with all your answers. Okay, the local Lagrangian will basically be this term, this term and the Einstein term. This is basically Einstein term with the delta. So this plus this plus this will be a local effective. Simple, beautiful local effective action for the type 2 string theory. Okay, we could do a similar exercise for the bosonic string and the heterotic string, but it's more complicated. We'll come back to that. Uh, but the type 2 is so simple, we have it. Okay, uh, any quick questions or comments? Otherwise, I'll go and apply for leave. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering, I mean, uh, wouldn't another way to see that uh, the, uh, a, uh, l let's say two graviton, uh, one uh, anti-symmetric tensor, uh, that would uh, uh, be cancelled just from the tensor structure? Oh, yes. Here. I mean, because uh, this V mu mu, that's manifestly symmetric, and for that piece, we have just one anti-symmetric uh, polarization tensor. Exactly. That's the, kind of, that's the exercise for you, to check that all these results that we see from Lagrangians also come out when you just look at the S matrices. Right, these, these things from, if it's all coming from a local Lagrangian, it's obvious. But you see the formalism of string theory is not obviously tied to some local space-time Lagrangian. I mean, it's so matrix and quantum filter. It's some rule for computing the S matrix. Now, where is the local Lagrangian in this loop? If it's all making sense, should we? How, are we totally sure it makes sense? Of course we are because there have been 50 years of work on string theory. But at this stage of our education in strict theory, you should be skeptical, right? I mean, <laughs> 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 because you can have a bunch of rules. And there are many ways to see it. it makes sense and does come from the local Lagrangian. The beta function on the well sheet is a good way. But still, in the end, all these arguments are have a slightly heuristic flavor to them. The real test is when it works. That was is really what convinces. That you have some physical picture of how things should happen, and some very complicated formalism, and it agrees with the physical picture. Then you feel okay, good stuff is happening. You know, we're not mathematicians, right? We're not doing things with the level of care that we're sure it's right. That requires a different level of thinking, which structures as complicated as the ones we deal with 
basically no human being knows how to do at the moment, right? Well, mathematicians don't even know what quantum field theory is. For them it's a ill-defined structure. Path integers give up. You know, so, so that level of care where you're sure everything you're saying is right is not the level at which we do physics. Maybe it's the level at which we do classical mechanics. Maybe f quantum mechanics, but not the level at which we do string theory or even quantum field theory. So this checking is a very important part of the game. It's very important because you're never really sure if you've taken every subtlety into account. And this is what really convinces you good things happen. Okay.